Hello, Jackie Barry here, and today I'm talking to Susan Armstrong, who I first met at the PSA Summit, that's the Professional Speakers Association uh, conference last year, where she did the amazing, an, an amazing presentation, and I thought we must connect because we've got so many thoughts in common about how you engage an audience, whether that's online or offline. Hello, Susan. Hello, Jackie. I'm really thrilled to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Susan runs GTT Worldwide Global Training Transformation, so there's not a lot she doesn't know about training and how it's supposed to work. First question, I have this theory that speaking is more about what to do and training is more about how you do it. And do you agree with that, that distinction? Absolutely, a thousand percent. I always think, you know, both of us speakers and trainers, uh, I always think in speaking, what we're doing is we're letting them know what something is and why it's important. So we're really influencing, aren't we, to, to create that buy-in. But, you know, we used to get 60 minutes to do a speech. These days, we're lucky if we get 20 or, or 30 or heaven forbid, woohoo, celebrate 45. Uh, we can't actually transfer skills in that short a period of time. We can transfer knowledge. So I agree, Jackie. I've always thought that in speaking, we're talking about the what and the why, but in training, in development, we cross over into the how, and that's where real learning can occur. It seems to me that during lockdown, the speakers have maybe suffered a bit more than the trainers. Um, yeah. I know that my speaking income was instantly cut yeah. and all my global travel was instantly cancelled. But my training work has picked up. I'm doing more of it. It's all online, obviously, and it is slightly less well paid. Uh, have you found the same thing? I have. Absolutely. And the one thing I have kept speaking um, but not in the normal way. So I've kept speaking, but a lot of it has been the global human resources and the global talent development conferences. So I've been lucky enough to, you know, speak with some very smart people at the forefront of their game. And the thing that we all agree on that's come out of this year, and it's good news for trainers, not so sure it's such good news for us as speakers, but what they're really looking for, what clients are really looking for is learning transfer. Now, you and I have been using that term for as long as we've been doing this, but clients have not been using that term. They haven't understood that. And now there's a greater understanding of that. And so, in fact, I think that the development opportunities are greater because rather than paying the money to hear the what and the why, they actually would rather pay the money to hear the how, to learn the how to put this into action. So um, same as you, you know, everybody seemed to freeze for about six weeks at the beginning. It was almost like everybody was getting their bearings. They didn't quite know what to do. And then I started getting a lot of inquiries for virtual training. Mm -hmm. so what do you think speakers need to know about training? What skills do they need to take on so that they can do learning transfer? It, it's a, a completely different mindset. You know, as a speaker, we're looked at as the expert and we're really there to disseminate the, the knowledge and the information and, and all of that. As somebody in training, it's more about creating the space for people to learn, creating the environment. So for a speaker, the harder shift, it's not really relinquishing control because I know that we both agree on this. We maintain control in training. It just looks different because it's participant centered. And I think that's the shift that speakers need to make. They need to get a little bit more comfortable in turning this over to their participants and having their participants come back with the knowledge versus the speaker always being the one that has to give that knowledge. So I, I think you agree with that as well. I think we've got the same philosophy on that. Yes, it is all about what the participants do and less about the sort of chalk and talk lecturing style of teaching that perhaps we all had when we went to school. Training adults doesn't really work that way. No. And, you know, there, there is an interesting, obviously, my accent. I was born and raised here in the UK, but spent many years living and working in North America. And what I found, well, I moved back here permanently about eight years ago, and it was really interesting what I found when I moved back. I couldn't figure out why I was in such high demand when I moved back over here. And then I figured out what it was, that the model 
in Europe tends to be a more vertical way of training. So in other words, they take a subject matter expert in the field and then they send them out to do training. So what it ends up looking like is a really long presentation with a couple of activities thrown in here or there, you know, to break up the monotony. But you and I both know that's really not what development is. It's, it's about theory and structure and it doesn't really matter where the learning comes from. You know, we always have really smart participants. And if they come up with the correct answers, I'm fine saying, hey, great job. You know, I don't feel the need to be the one that always has the knowledge. And so I think that's a difficult shift for speakers to make is kind of to take that back seat and let it be all about the participants. But that's what clients are paying for right now. And you mentioned activities just then, which of course is what the Experiential Speaking book is about. Published in 2019, not the best time to release a book of icebreakers <laughs> and energizers that assume everyone's all in the same room at the same time. Um, but I am working on a new book of online activities and that is in response to demand. People ask me almost daily or weekly, can I have an idea for a breakout? How can I use Zoom to do this? So, yeah. so the only reason it's not published yet is because I keep having more ideas. Uh, but yeah, that's coming soon. Have you got favorite icebreakers, energizers that you use online or offline? That <laughs> not just for the sake of it, because we both know it, they might be fun, but they're not just for fun. Yeah. The point of using them is to help embed the learning and engage your audience. Okay, so thank you for saying that, because um, the, my first thing is, and again, very personal viewpoint after doing this for 25 years, um, I, I do not like the energizer icebreaker kind of, of tag, because historically, you know, you go into a training session, and there's colored pencils and tape and scissors and paper, and it's like, build your, you know, dream vacation home. And I, I as a participant, I would always think, why? You know, what does this have to do with anything? What is the purpose? So I do use icebreakers. The icebreaker part, I think, is legitimate. Um, and I think all of our training should be energizing. We shouldn't need energizers. The training itself should be energizing. We should be, the activity should be, so it should take care of itself. So specifically through COVID, I've always done this, but it's become more important through this COVID pandemic. The icebreaker I always use is one in breakout groups um, and it serves a number of different purposes. So I always give them a topic. Let's say I've recently been doing a lot of change management. So the breakout activity, the icebreaker, if you will, because it serves as an icebreaker, uh, I ask them, what are their biggest challenges during COVID? You know, if it's a group of leaders, what have their biggest leadership challenges been in breakout groups? So it serves a number of purposes. It does break the ice. They get used to the technology. They get used to working with each other. They get to talk to people maybe they haven't met before. They're collaborating. And we all know that if they're doing, the time is going very quick. If we're talking, it's not going so quick. <laughs> so they spend the time talking about their challenges, their struggles, you know, they capture that list. And in the meantime, it's breaking the ice and they're realizing that they're not alone. For me, when they report back, it gives me really good information about where to focus the session. And it gives me really good information about what's going on in the world in terms of the topic that I happen to be teaching that day. So that's how I use um, the, uh, that's my standard icebreaker. Again, the topic, et cetera, may change, but I always do that to send that nonverbal message that this is not going to be a session where you get to check your email. You know, it's going to be very experiential and involved. But on Zoom, and, and I will confess that um, while I'm certified in Adobe Connect and WebEx, and I have been doing online training since, I don't know, 2009, 2010, something like that, Zoom is my favorite platform. Um, there are things that I wish were better, you know, I could interchange the different functionality, but I like it because there's so much variety. The breakout groups work, work really well with in terms of people being able to see each other. Uh, they can have access to their own computer. I get fantastic PowerPoint presentations from groups, you know, where they get to be really creative. But I confess, I love, love, love my annotation tools. Love them. 
So I create matching exercises, you know, I create whiteboards where they have to type their ideas or draw a picture or, you know, I'll have a list where they have to put their little stamp beside it to identify their top three things. So I, I do love my, um, my annotation tools. Now I still have people build things. So normal things that we would do in a classroom, you know, uh, there's a lot of physical activity that we can't replicate virtually, but I still will have people build things and demonstrate what they've built. And always there's a point to it. It's not just for the sake of it, but I still have them do that on camera and we kind of all show our, you know, what we've built and then we pull out the learning points. So I think that the more functionality of the medium that you're using that you can use, the better. I also don't think training should be formulaic. So I don't think it should be lecturette, breakout group, lecturette, breakout group. I think there needs to be a mix. And we've got annotation tools and breakout rooms and whiteboards and polling, and they can, you know, share their own screen. And there's just so, oh, I use filters. I, again, through COVID. I'll say, okay, biggest challenges through COVID, you know, in selling. And I'll say, and then choose the Zoom filter that captures your mood kind of thing. And everybody shows up with a weird hat or, you know, a Z's across their head. Anything I can to have a little bit of fun, to make sure that they're energized, uh, to get them involved, but still within the learning objectives of the program. So there's always a point. I always say there's always a method to my madness, even when I'm asking you to build an origami bird. I am so with you on everything you've just said and Zoom has become my playground. Yeah. I, I used it for years before this situation arose, um, but I use all the functionality in creative ways and always with a point because the, the audience, the participants have to understand why you're asking them to do something and what they get out of it. Yeah. Because too many people do this stuff badly or, or not at all. And, and that's what gives <laughs> Zoom a bad reputation and online experience generally a bad reputation. Absolutely. But can I ask you, Jackie, don't you think it comes back to the design of the program? Because too many times I see questions online about, but what do I get people to do in breakout groups? And I think, yeesh, you know, there needs to be a design, don't you think? Well, this is what I was coming on to, actually. Before I do, let me ask you one other question about, we talked a little bit about mistakes speakers make or, or, or the mindset shift that they maybe need how about trainers what would you say is the biggest mistake trainers make i think the biggest mistake trainers make is not re is not respecting the medium um, and what i mean by that is you know in in person it's personally in person this is a lot easier for me i can see and feel everything that's going on in the room. You know, I can, I can feel if I'm going too fast or too slow. I can see if people are getting it, if they aren't getting it. We can, we can visually see all of that. So when we use virtual means, it takes a lot more energy and effort. And, you know, I wonder when trainers say, oh yeah, you know, I'm always going to do it this way. And it's so much easier. I think, hmm, because we have to see, we have to visit those breakout rooms, we have to observe, and, and we have to amp up our energy. And it's like being on the radio, you know, or being on television. We have to amp up that energy and our voice has to amp up. And that does take a lot of energy. So I would say for trainers, we can't, it's not same old, same old, like we're in a classroom. There's additional preparation that needs to go on. And there's additional considerations when we're actually doing the session, like our energy and our presence. And, you know, can they feel it through that computer? You're right. It goes way beyond the tech. Um, and of course, that does lead us back into training design. And I know that's your area of absolute expertise. And I've worked through your online program about how do you deliver a good online training course? So without giving away too much from that course, what is the one main tip that you think uh, you would be willing to share with this audience of speakers and trainers who are interested in experiential speaking? Just one tip. 
two can i have two you can have two Go okay on. all right if you want. all right so i think the first thing that is really important are the levels of learning you know that there are different levels that we can actually train to and this goes right back to the beginning of our conversation the first two levels being knowledge and comprehension that's what we do when we're speaking we need to cross that divide though, because the third level being application. Now we're talking about a cognitive domain in training, which is where most of us live anyway. You know, it, it's the leadership skills and the coaching and sales and all of that. Uh, but we need to cross that divide. And the first level uh, that we cross to is application. So it's the third level in training, but application means can they apply the knowledge that they comprehend. So can they apply it? Deeper levels then go into synthesis. So can they take that concept and apply it to their work? You know, can they, can they smoosh it around a little bit so that it applies to what they do every day? Um, and then of course we can go into deeper levels, but most good training will at least hit application and synthesis. So be aware of the levels in training. The second thing that I would say is learning styles not the NLP kind, not, you know, kinesthetic, auditory, or visual. That's a different type of style. Learning styles really look at, if you think about, if you bought a piece of flat pack furniture, how would you go about putting that together? Because we do all have very different learning styles, and that's the point in designing a good program. We need to design that interaction so that we're capturing all of those learning styles. Left to our own devices, we design a program that fits with our personal learning style. But if you've got a learning style that's only represented by 11% of the population, then you've got 89% of your audience who's not learning anything. Yeah, I find that so often that people communicate from their own preference, not being aware that there are all these other preferences out there. And there's no value judgment on any of them. There's no right or wrong to it. But if you want to be an effective communicator, you have to be flexible and adapt your content to suit a group of people. If you're, if you're dealing one to one, it's different because um, that might be a mentoring program or something that you do that, of course, a lot of speakers and trainers are also launching as services um, because there is demand. There's still a need for a for the knowledge that we experts have yeah. and people are still paying for it. And we just have to be on the subject of being flexible, have to adapt the channels that we use to deliver it. Um, and there is work out there. There is work out there and, uh, you know, for full fee, there's full fee work out there as well. But again, it comes back to clients aren't, they're not, they're buying the end result. You know, and if you're going to tell people that you're going to change the way people function as a team, you can't do that through just telling people what it is and why it's important. There have to be those experiential activities so that they have the aha moments that say, oh, I get why this isn't working or, oh, I get why we're always in conflict. So those have to happen. That's what clients are paying for these days. And the skills that are needed in the future are the skills that we as speakers all talk about. You know, it's those interpersonal skills, those those soft skills of, of compassion and communication and teamwork and creativity and all of that, those are hugely in demand. There is full fee paid work out there, but the quality has to be there. They're buying an end result, which means the back end, what you and I focus on, the design needs to be really solid. It's absolutely not having an audience who sit passively and listen to your entertaining stories or <laughs> get motivated. Um, it really is about learning transfer, isn't it? And it really is. So if people want to transfer some of the learning in your head into their own head so that they can design their own programs better, how can they find out more? Uh, well, they can go to gttworldwide.com. So gttworldwide.com, pretty simple. And there's all kinds of information there. And we post videos or, or um, blogs on there. You can also find us at GTT Worldwide on Facebook, as well as on LinkedIn. And we're always producing new content videos um, that you can go ahead and learn about learning objectives or learning cycles or all kinds of things. 
And what's the title of that online program about how to design an online program? You will find information on the GTT Worldwide uh, website about designing high impact training. So it is an online program comes with a, I'm not going to call it a workbook, it's a reference manual that's about 50 pages long with all of the theory in there, as well as a worksheet where you can design your program as you go through the modules. So Jackie, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I don't think it's particularly taxing. We made them short videos on purpose to allow people to build a program as they go through. Well, you have to practice what you preach, don't you? If you're you talking do. about how to design a learning program, you've got to do a good job of it yourself. Exactly. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to add that I haven't asked? I would just like to say, in order to do this well, whether you're a speaker or a trainer, please try and use as many functionalities as you can of whatever platform you are using. Because again, if you know, training that is formulaic gets very boring after a while. So we need to be extra creative, extra enthusiastic, and that's how we keep people's attention. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Jackie.